Uh, I'm going to just briefly move on um, before I finish to uh, the final aspects, which is moving from heart failure patients to other areas where adaptive server ventilation is of interest, and it's broadly these ones. And we had a fantastic symposium yesterday on the different sorts of central sleep apnea, treatment emergent central sleep apnea, uh, CPAP resistant central sleep apnea, and another uh, excellent session this morning on opioid-induced sleep disordered breathing. And I think these are the main areas. And Michael, uh, after me, is going to uh, discuss some case examples of these in much more detail. He has some lovely slides. So we're talking about treatment emergent CSA. We would see in many sleep labs. Um, prevalence is, is, is variable, but it's more likely to be seen in patients uh, at higher risk when they have severe obstructive sleep apnea at baseline, that there's already central sleep apnea at baseline, or there are other risk factors such as their opioid users. Uh, and this is a study um, as an accompanying editorial, which is an interesting read by Morgan Thaler et al., looking at um, treatment emergent uh, central sleep apnea in OSA patients started on CPAP. This is a comparison at 90 days, uh, ASV and CPAP, and you can see that in terms of the apnea hypopnea index being reduced to less than 10 or less than 5, um, the ASV was more effective, so there's a greater chance of reducing the apnea hypopnea index on ASV in eye disease in disease than, than CPAP. And again, in this uh, paper by uh, Marie Peer and, and Holger Verla and Michael, uh, summarising, uh, it's a helpful paper, summarising a number of the studies in this area. Um, this is the treatment emergent central sleep apnea in, in, in OSA patients. You can see there have been a variety of studies. Um, the short or long-term studies, some only one night, some over longer periods of time, variable numbers of patients, but tending to suggest... Um, that outcomes can be better on adaptive sober ventilation uh, compared to other treatments. We have to bear in mind that some of these patients, in fact, many of the majority of these patients are going to resolve anyway, but there remains a hard core of patients who still have central sleep apnea that needs to be addressed. Interesting group of patients, and I just picked this um, data and made a slide from a patient we saw on the ward a, a couple of weeks ago. Quite um, difficult to see, but this patient, this is a simple uh, respiratory polygraphy study, had a mixture of events, but central events, a mixed hypopneas. Uh, he's a patient um, who had gait problems. It chimes in with a, a nice um, abstract from Grenoble yesterday describing gait problems and obstructive sleep apnea, but he's presented largely with gait problems. Uh, he was tried on CPAP, but with a colossal problem with um, emergent central sleep apnea, not able to tolerate it. And actually, we had managed to make him somewhat worse on CPAP. But when switched to adaptive server ventilation, this is where the apneas and hypopneas would come in, uh, they were almost completely eradicated. Important area, obviously, a huge growth area is in opioid use. And this is a tremendously interesting group of patients from a pathophysiological um, point of view because they have the full gamut of, of sleep disordered breathing from obstructive sleep apnea to mixed problems to uh, central sleep apnea to, to hypoventilation. And this incredibly um, interesting pattern of breathing, often frequent variation in, in breathing weight, tidal volume, duration of apnea, so that you really have to analyse them and study them in detail to know how you're going to approach the problem. And I've just put one study here, which is an interesting one, comparing not CPAP this time, but bi-level um, non-invasive ventilation with adaptive server ventilation in a group of patients with um, predominant central sleep apnea, Treated here, blue is the bi-level and the grey is the adaptive server ventilation. And in terms of all the events, the central events uh, and uh, all the types of respiratory events, there was significant improvement uh, using adaptive server ventilation compared to bi-level ventilation. You can see that the respiratory parameters were, were normalised in about 80%. And one has to say here, these are not vast vast trials, they're shorter or long-term trials, but I still think in this information it gives you, in this sort of trial situation, it gives you practical information when you have the patient sat in front of you or you have the results of their sleep study in front of you. So to conclude, I think where we are now is... Um, 
that we're still trying to understand the mechanism by which adaptive servoventilation cause problems in patients with um, systolic heart failure and that we should not be using a, a ASV in patients with systolic heart failure with ejection fractions of less than 45%, but we may use it in patients with higher ejection fractions, and we have some information, including from the CAT-HF trial and some other studies, earlier bitter study in, um, in preserved ejection fraction patients, uh, that it may be beneficially used on the basis of those studies I just showed you in patients with complex sleep apnea and treatment emergent central sleep apnea. Uh, I think as the opioid um, treatment group uh, or, or it demonstrates we have to completely understand carefully the form of sleep disorder breathing that is there and that while uh, adaptive servo ventilation may be useful in some, in some situations, we need to definitely determine, for example, if hypoventilation is there with hypercapnia, then that there is no indication for uh, ASV and that is likely to be best treated with non-invasive ventilation. And I think most interestingly of all, what we've learned from these trials is more about the pathophysiology of sleep disordered breathing and cardiac function, um, which are helping us understand the pros and cons and risks of positive pressure therapy, but we have much more to learn. Thank you very much.